Okay, if we were in a face to face class, I would distribute this handout and we would and I would go over. Um, I realize, you know, I don't want to take time covering what you can read yourselves, but um, I try and add some context for what I'm asking you to do as well as uh, answer questions. Now, I give a target range of words, and the reason that I do this, this, you know, this course is not only about the study of literature, but it's also about writing about literature. It's actually the follow-up course to English 1101, um, and so what we do in this particular course really emphasizes critical thinking skills as well as your understanding and reflection on things that you read. Um, so this is a 100-point paper. And the reason that I give you a target range of, of, of words is to kind of show you what the scope needs to be, you know, how broad your focus needs to be. Um, so if you think of it in terms of a target, for example, all right, uh, the bullseye would be if you write somewhere between 600 and 750 words. And Microsoft Word provides, and I think most word processing programs, provides a word count for you. I think it's down in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, now the, the next level, on, oh that's a terrible drawing, the next level on the bullseye would be a little bit shorter, say 550, a little bit longer, let's say up to 900. That's not an issue, okay? Where the problem comes in is this outer layer on the, on the target, okay? If you write, uh, if you have fewer words than 550 or more than 900, you've either overdeveloped uh, and you're not really controlling your information or you've underdeveloped, which means that you're writing about something that you don't really maybe have enough to say about. Often that can be fixed by making sure that whatever you're saying, you provide good examples. As a matter of fact, that's the most effective way to write about literature is to not only say something, but provide examples from the text, literally quoting word for word with quotation marks to illustrate what you're talking about. Okay. Now, this is an analysis paper. Uh, when you analyze something, you break it down into its parts and examine it. And so what we're doing to kind of pull together what you studied during this first five weeks, um, I want you to focus on one of the short stories and one of the particular elements we've covered and analyze the story, um, for example, characterization or setting. Um, to sort of show the meaning, how, how the author um, illustrates or, or, or develops a theme through that use of characterization or through that setting. What role um, does that literary element play in this piece? Okay. So for example, in some short stories, the setting is more important than others. Um, I would argue, and I use this example in my handout here, um, that the Civil War, the Irish Civil War, um, the fact that it is a civil war is crucial to understanding the real horror of this particular story as the sniper discovers he's killed his own brother. Um, so the setting is particularly important and the fact that he's pinned down on a rooftop and he can't get off and, you know, so there, there's several things about um, that particular setting taking place uh, at that time during those circumstances that are very important um, to our to the effectiveness of the story itself. Okay, um, so you've got a couple of short reading assignments online um, to this text. Now I don't want you to get hung up in this terminology. Um, you make assertions, you provide examples, you explain your examples, and you show sig significance. Please understand that I'm not going to go through your paragraphs and go, okay, there's an assertion. Okay, there's a. Uh, it's not that, but more, this is actually kind of an outline to show you how the paragraphs should sort of come together. Um, and I really like this in uh, this paragraph that I've lifted from your reading assignment, um, which talks about the fact that, um, you know, you express an opinion, which is what the assertion is. You support the opinion by using examples, and then you sort of explain the significance. Why does this matter? to what's, you know, overall going on in the story itself, okay? Um, so again, please don't get hung up on the terminology there, but, but realize that this is really what you're doing in an analysis. You're looking at something very closely and you're trying to show why it's significant um, in, in that particular story, okay? So what I do is I break down, of course, in this handout, I recommend students print it off, you know, uh, for easy review if you need, you know, if it would be helpful to you. 
Um, of course, choose just one story and just one literary element. Okay, so let me address that um, first. 600 to 750 words is not a long essay. You know, it's roughly two and a half to three typed pages. It's really not that lengthy. So you can't honestly do a good job trying to develop more than one literary element, for example, okay, um, in that short a space. So pick one that you feel comfortable with. And I reckon, you know, I, I suggested that if you wanted to look back at the different journal writes that you've done this uh, so far. And by the way, I've graded almost all of your work at this point. I'm still working on um, a couple of, of students' um, assignments. But by tomorrow at noon, everything should be graded, okay, which will help you prepare for the test. But you can look back at your journal rights um, if you want some ideas. Some of you did some, some really marvelous work in those journals. And I actually don't mind if it does, um, if what you've written lends itself to this assignment, if you actually copy parts of it. You know, if, you, if that works for you, then, then that's great, okay? Um, but that's one way that you might get an idea because you've already been thinking about um, a particular story uh, and, and looking at sort of the elemental and thematic elements there. Now, you need an overall thesis, and the thesis is essentially the main point that you want to make. This is the, the, the whole, what will hold the whole paper together, okay? Um, I suggest that you look back at the story. Once you've decided what you want to do, you take some notes. And although you're, I'm not requiring that you do turn in any kind of pre-writing for me or any kind of outlining, but, um, but that can be helpful to you. Now, you have a draft of this paper due um, Monday night, by Monday night. And I'm going to show you in a second how to, if you've never used a Turnitin Dropbox before, um, if you've taken English 1101 at uh, Georgia Northwestern, you probably have. But for those of you who may not have, I'm going to show you how to access that Dropbox and also how to access feedback. My feedback will be available a week from today after 4 o'clock. Um, if I finish earlier than that, I will send an email. I do hope you're checking your emails regularly. Um, but I will show you also how to access my feedback. I not only type comments, but I also um, record up to four, uh, three minutes of and I can say a lot in three minutes, okay? So I, I kind of look over your draft and I, and I help you identify weaknesses and strengths in the paper so that you know how to revise it before the final paper in which you actually, that will receive the big grade, okay? I just give 10 points, by the way, for turning in a draft. That's just, it's kind of like a participation grade. Um, but I don't take late drafts, so um, please be aware of that. Now, the paper can be a bit shorter, but at least try to have some kind of introduction, some kind of body paragraphs, and some type of conclusion. All right, number five, let's see, I just, I've just covered all of that. Um, somebody may need to mute unless you have a question. I'll, I'll pause here because I know I talk kind of quickly. I'm going to try and keep this under an hour because I want to be very conscious of your time. Um, does somebody have a question at this point? All right, if not, um, the final Turnitin Dropbox for the, for the final paper, uh, you, you actually go back to the week, uh, it's in the week six folder, not week five, so that's a mistake, my, my error. Um, you go back to the week uh, six folder where you uploaded your paper, you click on the title and it'll open it up and I'll show you that in a second. The final paper itself is due, uh, there will be a, when week seven opens, the, um, the assignment is due in that uh, turn it in Dropbox for the final assignment. I do, by the way, take late drafts, I mean late final papers, uh, for up to three days, but it's with a 10% per, per day penalty. Um, I, there's a late work policy on the syllabus that kind of explains this. It also explains our grace period. I know several of you have missed a few assignments, and it's during this grace period, and it's kind of the middle week in March, I think. Uh, and I'll send more information when we're closer to it. But you can make up um, small assignments. You can't make up papers. You can't make up drafts. You can't make up tests. But if for some reason you miss an assignment um, during, that's the period in which you may make it up. However, I will accept uh, late papers up to three days late. So let me explain that. Papers due Monday night. If you turn it in Wednesday, 
for example. Uh, the drop box will still be open for the final papers. Um, but if you turn it in Wednesday, and let's say I grade that paper and you make an 83. But because it's two days late, that lowers it to 63. That's 10% per day, right? 10 points per day. Um, truthfully, rarely do students turn in papers late because you've already been through the drafting process. You've already gotten feedback. So most everybody has something down on paper to work with. Okay. Uh, additional guidelines, please do not do research. All right. This, this paper, and as, as a matter of fact, um, I, under the plagiarism policy as well as under additional notes on your syllabus, I'm pretty clear about not doing additional research for assignments um, and turning that in as though that's, you know, something that, that those are your ideas uh, until we get to the research paper. Now, I want to draw a distinction here, and I think if you took the time to watch the course orientation video, um, I made this distinction then as well. It's the mark of a scholar, honestly. It's the mark of a student to do extra work, to do extra research, to understand something. Um, so, for example, if we read a short story or a poem or a play and you don't get it, and the information that I provide for you, whatever that may be, is not helpful enough and you still don't understand it, I encourage you to go online and keep looking and find things to read that will help you better understand uh, what you understand that short story or that poem or that play. That's fine. Where it's not fine is what, if you do it on a test or you do it to answer questions. Anything where you're supposed to show me what you understand, that's where the problem comes in. And with the first two papers that you're going to do for me, this one and then the, the poetry uh, explication paper, I want you to work, show me what you know, show me what you understand and how to do uh, uh, when you when you write these papers, okay? So there's a distinction there. The final paper, then we'll get into actually doing research and review modern language association guidelines and so forth, okay? So in other words, please choose a short story you understand and choose a literary element that you understand. Um, be sure to do all the reading that I've included. Now this particular paper, please don't put yourself in it, okay? This is supposed to be written from a more objective um, point of view. Now I realize that the fact that it says your opinion uh, would indicate that you would say in my opinion or I think, but this is actually not a reflection paper. This is more Yes, it's based on your understanding and your opinions, but uh, you really shouldn't sh say that in this particular paper, okay? Um, so instead, it should be written, you, you can use things like the reader, and even we is not necessarily, uh, even though it's, it's first person plural, when you're talking about us as readers, that's not as much of a problem as referring to yourself, the writer. Um, I hope that makes sense. So what you can say is something like, when the reader first encounters uh, Thomas builds the fire. You know, he or she believes that this character is uh, is a little bit crazy or something like that. Okay. Um, also, don't directly address the audience. Second person, you. Okay. Um, try to keep the level of diction that you use, and diction simply means word choice. Try and keep it at that mid-level uh, where it's not too um, convoluted, all right, and, or too um, casual. In American culture, we've gotten extremely casual because of things like text messaging and, um, you know, BRB and all these, these sort of abbreviations and a lot of contractions and that kind of thing. Try and write at that mid-level where you're not using contractions, where you're not um, using abbrevi inappropriate abbreviations. Um, you know, in other words, it's, it's an academic level uh, of writing. All right, you do need to type it in Microsoft, uh, in Microsoft Word or at least convert to a Microsoft Word document. I don't think Turnitin will take anything other than um, .docx files or .pdfs, okay? Um, I think it will take either one of those, but um, if you, for example, have an Apple product, uh, I can't open those files. So, um, so please make sure, and I think this information too is on your syllabus. And be aware that all students, um, 
if you're a, a GNTC student, has access to Microsoft Office products. Okay. Um, the title needs to be relevant to the subject matter, so it shouldn't be analysis essay or the title of the short story. You do need a thesis. Uh, it can be implied, and I don't know if you study this in English 1101 or not, but an implied thesis means that there's not one sentence that the reader could point to and say, that's the main point of this paper. Um, but from reading it, it's very obvious what it is. Okay? Uh, explicit, normally a thesis is the last sentence in the introductory paragraph. The introduction sets up the, uh, the main point that you want to make in the paper, and then the paper goes about uh, developing those points. Uh, page formatting, we'll look at that really quickly in a second. Uh, please don't worry about documentation for this paper at this time. Uh, since we are pulling from online sources uh, in, in lieu of having a textbook, um, we're not going to worry about documentation for this particular paper. So you don't need, in other words, a bibliographic entry on a works cited page at the end of it. One of the number one issues that I have with students writing this paper is that they're spending one to two paragraphs just summarizing what happens in their short story. That's not the focus of the paper, okay? Uh, I've, I've read it. <laughs> I've read the stories. So you don't need to sort of rehash what happens. Instead, pull out those plot events that support what it, the points that you want to make, okay? It's a point that support your assertions um, rather than just devote time to summarizing plot what happens in the story, okay? I hope that, I hope that makes sense. Um, the one thing that I've asked you not to do since you've already written about the sniper characterization and the diagnostic right for me, um, please do not um, choose that as your focus. Okay. Um, last point about this and I'm going to show you about turn it in and we'll move on to the review, uh, reviewing for the test. Your page format should look like this. You're probably familiar with it, but this is sort of traditional MLA page formatting, not documentation formatting, page formatting. Um, with the student name in the left hand corner, English 1102, my name, and then spell out the date. Okay. Normally in a short paper, you don't really have to worry about page numbers so much, but should, if you do, then it would be your last name and the page number here, and that's repeated on every page. This part is not, this part is with the, the new page number. Then you um, title, uh, center your title. Please double space between your lines, indent your paragraphs. Um, I will we'll re remind you of all this, but and by the way, this note just comes from, this is a footnote from um, that paragraph that I quoted from the reading assignment. All right, I'm going to pause now and see if anybody has any questions about this particular paper. All right, if not, then let me show you how to upload a paper to turn it in if you're unfamiliar with it. And then we'll move on to the review part um, section. All right, this was from a few semesters ago. It was a different assignment, but um, this is what happens when you open up the Turnitin Dropbox that's in your week six folder uh, for the paper. And it will look something like this. Um, now, this is the instructor format, so it'll be a little bit different because in this case it will just have your name automatically, uh, de it, by default it will be there. And so what you want to do is upload a paper. So you select Submit, and then you select, your name again will be defaulted here, so all you have to do is you can um, you have to enter a title. It will prompt you if you don't. So you type a title here. Okay. Now you have an option of either uh, up finding your file on, uh, on your computer or laptop and uploading it, or you can actually print it. Uh, I mean, uh, copy and paste it. Um, but often if you copy and paste it, what happens is the system strips the formatting. So for example, your paragraphs will run together or they won't be indented or something like that. So it's preferable if you want to upload what you've written exactly the way that it looks when you typed it, uh, it's preferable to actually upload the file. Okay. And then you select choose file. 
And this is where you go online and you find, you know, wherever you've saved your your paper and you and you double click it and upload it. Uh, it will appear there, and then you select submit paper. Now, if you have an accurate submission, uh, what will happen? There'll be a green band across the top of the page here. I can't do it because this is a previous year and there's already a file there, but um, there'll be a green band that tells you that you were successful, and they will also give you a receipt. So it's always clear if you if you um, uploaded your paper successfully. There's no confusion about it. Okay, they'll give you a receipt that tells you there's it assigns it a document number and all this kind of stuff. If you're unsuccessful, there will be a red band across the top and there will be notes explaining why it was not successful. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Now let me show you when you go to retrieve the format since we're already having this um, live lecture. Let me show you what that's going to look like. Your screen will look a little bit different from this because, uh, again, this is the instructor view and I don't have access to student view. Uh, but this was a student's paper from, uh, from a, a couple, I guess, maybe it was a year ago, something like that, a different type of assignment. Um, so here, of course, she's got format correct. She's, um, She's done that correctly, it's centered her title, notice that she's indented the paragraphs, notice that she's double spaced between them. This is what your page should look like, okay? Um, again, I give 10 points just for participating, getting your draft in on time. And then at the very top of the page, uh, the very first note you'll have will either be an E, an M, or an L. Uh, on your syllabus, I explain this is how I handle drafts, okay? Um, because most students, when you when they submit a paper, what they want to know is, if I were to grade it on that day, what grade would they receive, even though it's just a draft? And so instead of giving, you know, letter or numeric grades, what I do instead is I use this little code. Uh, an E uh, would indicate that it's an early stage draft. And what it means is you've got to start, but at this point the paper would not be successful. Um, so, and it, But the good news is I tell you how to fix it, right? But if I were to grade it on that day, it would not make above a D, okay? A C, uh, an M level draft, if I type M, and like this student received a, an L, if I type M, an M level draft, then, and again, all this information is on your syllabus, uh, under grades. An M level draft indicates that it's a mid stage draft, um, that there's probably there's good organization, maybe it needs more development, maybe there are excessive uh, technical errors. But the good news is, I tell you how to fix it. An M indicates that it would probably make a C if I were to grade the paper on that day. Okay. Now, an L stage draft indicates a late stage draft, and that means that the paper just needs a little bit of work. Um, usually there's not a lot that needs to be done to it, and then um, whatever, you know, I give you some indication of what needs to be fixed, if anything, but if I were to grade the paper on that day, it would make a, a B or an, a high B or an A, okay? Um, now, oftentimes what I'll, I'll type is E slash M, which means it's sort of between early and, and mid. That's kind of D plus C minus range. Or if I type um, M slash L, that would indicate that it's between a mid stage and late stage. So that's C plus B minus range. I hope this is not confusing you. I hope it makes sense. Um, these are just my ways of trying to give as much feedback as possible to students um, so that they know how to improve their skills. Okay, so I type comments. I also have this handy dandy little um, ability to, uh, now you don't have this, but I can actually drag errors over here. Um, and like, for example, this one I drag over CS, that means comma splice. And then the uh, for a lot of these, the rules will open up and it will explain to you the rule and what the issue is, okay? But even more importantly, I record feedback. And um, so on the left, on the right hand side of your screen, somewhere you will find a check mark and an error, and then you'll find an arrow. If you play that, that's where my feedback is. 
This is a really good paper, Margaret. You've done exactly what I hope students would do with this assignment. Um, you worked very closely with the text, including quoting. All right, so that gives you some indication of what that will be like. Okay. Um, and I give us, you know, I, I record up to three minutes of feedback, uh, up to three minutes. The system allows me to record up to three minutes of feedback. And um, let's see, where was I? And I try and tell you as much as I can without sort of taking over the work for you. But I, I, I give you some ideas about revision. Um, one of the things about writing, as you probably know, and part of the reason writing is so difficult is because uh, we do it often in a vacuum. And so by having the chance for revision, for feedback and revision, it, it compensates for that vacuum. And often, uh, I don't know about you, but when I write something, usually if I come back to it in a week, even, or two weeks, I can see where the problems are. But when I initially write it, I'm so close to it that I'm not aware of how to, of what's going right and what's going wrong. So um, anyway, so you'll have a week. Again, my feedback will be available. If you get your draft in, um, my feedback will be available by next Thursday, uh, usually after four o'clock. And then it will be both typed and, and uh, recorded. And then you have until the following Monday to make those changes and upload a final paper for the, for the big grade. I'm going to pause there. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, I have a question. Yeah. OK. Um, how do you feel about taking advantage of GNTC uh, remote tutoring or net tutoring uh, in addition to your own feedback? I encourage it. I Real world scenarios, honestly, Craig, um, nobody writes in a vacuum. Every, I mean, you know, if you read a novel or something that somebody's written, you'll notice in the first, like the fly page, the first few pages that will give credit to all the readers. Um, I believe in getting as much feedback as you as you're willing to, and so I encourage students and everyone from my A students to students who really struggle do use NetTutor. Um, so I'm very happy for you to do it. A lot of times, what students will find is that they they kind of hear the same thing from both of us of their issues. Um, but I, you know, that doesn't mean that, that they're not things that they will not be more exhaustive about. And with NetTutor, you know, they do identify, you do identify two areas. Like if you know you have certain weaknesses as a writer, um, whether it be gra grammatical structure or sticking to a thesis or whatever, um, you, uh, you identify those two areas and get feedback on those two areas. And, you know, I, I think it's a, a, a great resource. Absolutely. Any other questions? All right, um, let's talk about review. And I'm going to go over a few things, notes with the short stories, and see if you have any questions. Um, this document is in your week six folder, um, you know, th that talks about the how to study for the unit uh, one test. Um, I tell you the structure right here. They're true, false. They are matching. This is strictly just matching literary terms and definitions. I realize most of you covered this in high school. Uh, I hope I provide a bit more depth um, and chance to apply that knowledge in, in what we're doing here. Um, but one of the my strongest piece of advice is don't get stuck on one point questions. Okay. As a matter of fact, because you can navigate through the test. Um, so you can even start at the end and work backwards if you want to. Um, you, uh, you know, that may be the thing to do because because as you progress through the test, the way that your questions are at the end, like for example, the very last uh, part five is the essay response. Uh, very important. Please notice that you only choose one, I give you three kind of broad uh, topics to choose from. Please just write about one of them uh, because in the, in the time, you know, this is a 90 minute timed test. And uh, once you start it, you have to finish it in that 90 minutes. It's automatically uploaded at the end of it. So you, you even though uh, it is an open note and open book test, and by that I mean, it's fine with me if you've got the short stories open to look at. It's fine with me if you look at some of the, at the PowerPoints or any other materials that I've provided for you. Um, 
but uh, or or that we've done as part of the lessons. I, that's my way of trying to compensate for the fact that this is an online course. Um, and so I, I realized that you don't have the benefit of the richness of discussion. If we were in a face to face class, there would be so many things that we would cover that really are just, you know, it's, it's very hard to do so in an online class. Um, so this is my way of trying to compensate for that. Um, and so it's fine with me if you use that. What you can't do, though, is click off on other sites and look up answers. I hope this is obvious. That's cheating. Um, and you can't work with other people. Um, so I say that at the outset because I have to tell you, it won't just be a question that fails. It will be the entire test should you do that and uh, and, for, and I have had students who have you know who've gone online and copied things that they found online um, so please understand the distinction between what's allowed and what's not allowed but in the time provided you only have time honestly to develop well one of these uh, essay topics notice you don't need an introduction and a conclusion and all that this is a this is an essay response on a test so just get right into the point you want to make but develop it well because I think it's yeah it's 25 points that's a quarter of the grade some short paragraph is not going to get you 25 points all right so please be aware um, one of the things that I recommend students do is let the point totals indicate how much you should write if that makes sense, okay. Um, so you do have some short answer questions, and some, and the point amounts will vary. If it's a two-point question, just get right to the point and answer it. You don't need a paragraph. If it's an eight-point question, that's asking for more development. That's asking for more detail, more specifics, okay. So please, uh, that's one little hint I would give you about um, about taking this test. So again, the true, false, the matching, multiple choice, and the multiple choice is a little bit complex because it does require some critical thinking. There may be some answers that are correct, but there's going to be one answer that's the best answer. All right. Um, so it checks for more than just memorization. Please study in advance. You don't want to spend your time since you can use open notes, open, open, you know, resource. Um, the short stories themselves, you don't want to spend your time looking up answers for one point questions. So study in advance, okay? Um, if I were taking this test, I would do one of two things. I would either begin at the end and write the essay first and then get to, then jump maybe to the beginning of it again. Or sometimes what some students find is as they go through these more objective, fact-based, knowledge, comprehension questions, when they get to the more significant, broader question, um, the earlier part of the test actually helps them, you know, uh, think of things to say. And usually these broad topics will have to do with our theme or they'll have to do with like choosing a setting in one short story and talking in depth about how that, sh that particular setting, uh, you know, supports what happens in the story itself. Okay. Uh, now the other thing to mention are the significant passages of what I do is I pull in, uh, passages uh, from the short stories. There'll be six to choose from, uh, six to choose from, you only need to select three of those passages, okay? You tell me what the story was, who's doing the talking, unless it's the narrator, and then you just say narrator, not the author, okay? It's the, it's the, it's who's speaking, who is the speaker? Um, and then um, you tell me the significance of the passage. Please don't just rewrite the pat, rewrite what it said in your own words. Don't just paraphrase it. I want to know why it's important. You know, what do these lines from this short story have to do with what's going on in the short story uh, and the broader theme? These are five points each. Once again, please only choose um, three. Some students are overachievers and they and they respond to all six. Honestly, I don't have time to grade that much <laughs> and to read and try and pick the best responses. So I just grade the first three, all right, that you that you submit. So um, so please just choose three. I hope that uh, that makes sense as well. Again, you identify not the not the author. You identify the work, the speaker, and then you tell me why that particular set of lines or sentences is, is significant. Why is it important to what's happening in the story? All right. Does anybody have any questions? about the test format itself before we get into re a review of the content.
All right, the rest of that document you can read um, in the week six folder. So finally, let's go back to you and talk about um, the stories that you read and let me answer any questions that you might have. Okay, and um, before we get to this, there are three additional terms that um, you didn't actually study um, specifically, but that we're definitely going to get into in more detail uh, as we read po um, get into our poetry unit, which is the next unit, unit two. Um, the first one is theme, and please understand that theme uh, in its broader sense means more than subject, okay? So, for example, love is the subject, but the comment that the writer or poet or playwright wants to make about love, that's a theme. Love hurts, you know, that's a theme. Uh, love is one of the most difficult things to, loss of love is one of the most difficult things to get over. That's a theme, all right? So please understand that when I'm asking you to, under, uh, to, to identify a, a theme, um, what I'm asking for is not only what's the subject matter, like for example, when many of you wrote about um, the theme of, and it was fine, I didn't count, I mean, we didn't, we haven't covered this until now, uh, and I certainly didn't count off for it, but in your journals when you read about this is what it means to um, say Phoenix, Arizona, and you talked about the theme being connectedness, that's exactly right, but that's really the subject. Um, the, the point that the author was trying to make about connectedness would be the theme. OK. Um, and at one point, of course, you know, Thomas built the fire is the one who so eloquently talks about everything being connected. Uh, if you can only see it, we may not see it, but everything's connected. And he was he was so connected to his environment, to the past, um, to the present and even to the future. You know, a lot of what happened and what he saw was prophetic in many ways. Um, and so he was the embodiment of that connectivity, if that makes sense, okay? So that's that's what, if you're gonna be, um, talk about theme and it's using its entire definition, that's what we're talking about. Um, symbolism is one thing standing for something more abstract, okay? And that's in its simplest definition, that's what we're talking about. You know, the eagle standing for patriotism, um, lion standing for courage. Occasionally students become confused and they think death is a symbol for something. No, something symbolizes death, it's not the opposite. For example, the black box in the lottery is definitely a symbol of death. I mean, it's that, that box of death, right? Uh, and then irony we will discuss in great detail uh, when we talk about literature, I mean uh, poetry, because um, one of the things, especially in more sophisticated writing, that uh, English instructors and professors try and tell their students is first rule out irony when you read something. Does it mean the opposite of what it's saying uh, or what it's revealing? Um, so that's what's that's what irony is. It's a very complex term, and we will uh, get into it more, especially again in poetry. All right, moving on to um, the sniper. I think uh, I know many students mentioned they'd read the sniper before. This piece and the lottery, and everyday use to some extent, are widely anthologized. Um, and what that means is that in collections of short stories, you will often find um, find these stories collected together. So a couple of points about the sniper, and then I'll see if you have any questions. Um, as I mentioned before, the Civil War setting is part of what um, actually leads to the horror at the end of this story. Um, that sort of surprising because uh, that surprising ending. I think because it kind of bypasses, at least it did me as a reader the first time I read it, and probably the second, I didn't really think about it. Um, you know, I don't know a lot about the Irish Civil War. It took place, at the big, um, I think, the second uh, decade in the uh, 20th century. Uh, the Irish Free Staters and, the, um, and then the Republican Irish uh, 
of Republicans were fighting and ended up in the split of Ireland. I don't know if you know anything about the history, but you know Ireland and even now Ireland, Northern Ireland is part of Great Britain. Um, so, um, and then the Republican, the Republic of Ireland is its own country um, to the south. And so uh, that was the result of this, uh, or part of the result of the Civil War. And so the whole idea of Civil War, war, I mean, is, is, hor is horrifying uh, in, because of death and um, necessity or no, but it's, there's still a horror to it. But the idea of, you know, in a Civil War, you are pitting people, often even relatives, on either side, as we know in our own Civil War, um, you know, against each other. And so that's part of what this story was was trying to to show, was that kind of idea of, of, of this, you know, man who came out successfully in this fight, but ended up losing indeed. Now there are two possible climaxes. When you, you know, one of the ways I would, I would, I would look back at the plot events, um, you had that little plot quiz about the sniper, and um, which I graded. You do have access to my feedback. Anytime you miss something, I try to indicate what it was that you missed and, and type out the correct answer. So you do have access to that. If you go back in my grades and you select the actual score, it should open up the quiz and you should be able to actually see feedback in, in, uh, on any test, any quiz. Okay. Um, and so please go back. That's one of the ways I would study is just look back through any of my comments, things that you've turned in, um, how you did, look back at those little uh, reading check quizzes, see what you missed, um, you know, because those are like little building blocks toward this larger, larger test. Now there are two possible climaxes that um, critics, uh, literary critics, a point to for this story. One is yes, when the sniper actually we do build to the point that the sniper actually does, um, even though he's wounded, he does shoot his opponent. That's one climax. And then after that, it's kind of you know he loses gas, he curses the war, he you know, and then this curiosity wins out. The second climax, um, some uh, readers and, and critics believe is when he actually does turn over uh, and we see the body and he sees the body of his brother. Now I, I do want to caution you about taking things too far. If the, the story itself does not say that he was horrified, he was, you know, and, and how we had to deal with this, then don't do that for the character. Does that make sense? We're horrified as readers. We're supposed to be. That's supposed to be the effect. But you can't put that onto this character. Does that make sense? <laughs> so um, sometimes students kind of read into the text. They put themselves there and they read into it what's not actually stated. A lot of times you can infer. Please don't get me wrong. Uh, but there's evidence to infer that. You can point to things and say, okay, this is how I know this is how he feels. Um, if that's not there, then don't, don't kind of put that on him. I hope that makes sense. Um, the characterization of the sniper, I think everybody did a really good job with that particular diagnostic essay. Um, characterizations, if, if it's a well-rounded character, it's more than two things, all right? Um, if you're talking about a, a well-rounded um, well character um, that's not flat, um, flat's two-dimensional, maybe two, uh, and when you did those uh, characterization, those little rights for me, and created a character. It, there had to be more going on there than just you know a couple of things. He was really generous, and the whole, if the whole thing showed he was really generous, that's not a well-rounded character. Okay, so this this guy, there was some complexity to him, right? Um, he looked young, but he had the eyes of a fanatic. So it's somebody who really believes in the cause. Um, but also, we see him go through some some changes af after he's gone through this whole process. He's very sharp. He's very smart. Uh, he does get careless. He does take he does take risks. Um, so there's a lot going on with him in this it's very short short story. And then of course we just talked about and denouement is a nice French term used in literary criticism that means the ending. Does anybody have any questions about the sniper? Feel free to type him or if you have a access to a microphone. Um, you can ask them. 
All right, the lottery, once again, several of you uh, several of you had read it. Uh, I read it, too, in high school. I remember the horror the, the first time I read it because I didn't see it coming at all. There's a lot of um, foreshadowing, and actually the story's more sus suspenseful if you read it the second time and know what's coming. <laughs> um, now, some of you, uh, the lottery lotteries now have positive connotations. This lottery obviously didn't, and it's not supposed to... It was set in a village or a town that's supposed to have been, had a post office, right? You, there was some equipment. Um, I think there was a sort of a town square. And it looked like an average summer day. I think it was, what, June 28th? Um, so this was supposed to be, the, 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 uh, um, the author intentionally did not name the town. Because what we were supposed to feel was, this is just a normal place anywhere. Obviously, things like this do not happen um, in the United States, do not happen in the civilized world uh, or the or, uh, first world, world countries. But, but it was essentially, um, Shirley Jackson got the idea from the agrarian calendar, agricultural calendar. Um, you know, it used to be, and especially in some pagan religions, I think Celtic religion, um, certainly it happened with, I think, the Aztecs, perhaps, and some other indigenous uh, primitive uh, peoples in, on different continents, where in order to have good crops, they would make human sacrifice. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think I read... Um, Oh, what was I reading? I think it was yesterday about an example of of how there used to be sacrifice. Um, anyway, I, I don't remember which particular culture. Now, of course, this is uh, I'm not sure that anyone does it anymore, but um, we would probably know about it. But this was uh, a, a, especially in cultures that re that depended on good. Uh, harvest in order to survive, this was their way of appeasing whatever gods they believed in and to, to actually have human sacrifice. And so that's actually the sort of history of where Shirley Jackson, the author, got this idea. Um, of course, there's a lot of foreshadowing this story. It builds to this point um, where, um, you know, the, the, the ultimate character, uh, Tessie, who arrives late, ironically, that's ironic, because um, you would think people would not be so busy, you know, doing their dishes that they forget to show up on time for something like this. Uh, so that's ironic. That's an example of irony. But notice that Tessie, too, she's very human in her response to what's happening, um, but she's not noble. OK, and she's not sacrificial. As a matter of fact, and the way that we know this is because Tessie, once it's narrowed down to her husband, you know, the men all draw for the families and then whoever has the black dot, just the people in that family draw uh, to see who the, the person ultimately is. And notice that it can even be a, a child, which is part of the horror of, of this whole thing. But um but notice that Tessie wants to bring in her married daughter to increase the odds that it won't be her. So, so Tessie's not necessarily a very noble character. She may be very human, but her response to this is, is anything but, but sacrificial. And of course, then it ends, um, you know, it ends and, and, and they've made, I think they made a, a, some little made for television movie based on the lottery. There've been, you know, this is a, a at the time it was, um, the story was really kind of shocking when it was published and, and the people who lived at but Shirley Jackson, uh, there's, there's sort of interesting history here. The, the author um, just, the, she couldn't stand all some of the townspeople that where she lived. And so what she was trying to show is that whole idea of blind obedience to tradition. Um, any questions about the lottery? All right, we'll move on to everyday use. Um, 1960s context, so that explains a little bit more. Um, probably most of you are, where all of you are too young to uh, recall this particular movement. But with the civil rights movement especially, um, a, a lot of African Americans, really, especially younger uh, African Americans and educated, uh, more educated, um, certainly, began to, to attempt to recover their roots in Africa. And there was um, hence the idea of Dee changing her name um, 
And the value that she was placing, the character of Dee, was placing on the quilts and different objects around Mama's house was purely because it was in style. Um, so that's the irony of that everyday use title, um, you know, where Dee is saying she won't take, you know, talking about Maggie and why she shouldn't have the quilts and she won't take care of them. Well, the irony is that in this context, it's actually more of a fad. Uh, or, or at least it was stylish at that point in time. And so D is like, uh, is, is revealing that, that kind of side of her that's very trendy. Uh, you can tell by the way she's dressed when she gets out of the car and mom is kind of shocked, you know, and, uh, and, the, and the person whom she's with, she just, uh, you know, she's, she's educated and she's, this, she, what she values now, she, she has her own, um, value in but she's reaching back to a, a, a different tradition whereas mama and maggie represent the tradition of that land and that time and that place um and their particular family line and and you can tell that d you know has been named after one of the the uh, dicey right her aunt um in the family and and but doesn't have that appreciation and so she changes her name uh, so that's another sign of that so that but the fact that it's set in the 1960s, I hope that provides a little bit more context about why this is significant. Um, the idea of traditions and whose tradition and which tradition wins out here. Um, I think everybody did a good job with the uh, looking at the who wrote about in their journals the quilt as a symbol. Um, because of course, you know, it's, it's patches, it's pieces of personal uh, family history, uh, which is significant. Um, but it's also um, symbolizes women's work. It symbolizes covering and warmth. And um, I don't know about you, but my family has all of these quilts that, that people, women in my family have made and passed down. They're very used. They're very worn. Um, but that's part of their significance. The climax of the story is it's very subtle, but when Mama takes that quilt and gives it to Maggie, that's actually the climax. And there's a very subtle change because Maggie is this beaten down character. Not that Mama didn't beat her. You did, you know, they're very much in some ways alike. Um, but Maggie, because of the fire, the burns, and her own temperament, is very shy. Is very, you know, you almost get the sense of someone who's just beaten down by the world in in. Um, and she's got this sort of narrow life, um, but things matter to her and people matter to her. And, and so that very subtle move when mama gives that quilt to, to, um, to Maggie, that is the climax of the story. And you can tell by the end of the story. And once again, it is subtle, uh, but Mag, there's a, there's a change there. There's a change in the family dynamic. Um, and then, of course, the characterization, I wrote a little bit about that on that secondary characterization chart, you know, about the different characters. You can sort of look at that. That was that handout that talked about characterization. Any questions on this? Because I don't want to run long. And the last two stories are probably the ones you have questions about. All right, let's get to it. This is what it means to say Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix, of course, symbolism. Most of you or a lot of you caught that. Uh, the Phoenix being the uh, mythological bird that essentially every, you know, there's a period of time, a uh, hundred years, whatever, lives. Then it burns into, it bursts into fire, burns to ash, and then from the ashes, a new Phoenix, Phoenix arises. And so um, many of you did note that that trailer in Phoenix, Arizona is exactly where um, Victor begins to have his, uh, his own personal renaissance, his own personal rebirth. And there are literally ashes there. Okay. You've got ashes that, that Victor, um, that Victor um, comes to, um, to collect as well as his dad's $300 in the bank in his truck and what the stereo and I think there's one other item. Um, now Thomas Bilzebeer, once again, notice that at the very beginning of the story, we all, and talking a little bit about the characterization of Thomas, 
the reader has the same sense because what we know is we see through the eyes of people who are rejecting him. And so initially we kind of respond, most of us, to Thomas Bills Bear the same way that the characters in the story do, um, that he's just sort of crazy and he's this guy that you try to avoid. But, but as the story progresses, he's the storyteller. And Native Americans, uh, like many um, indigenous peoples, they're, they, they rely on oral history to um, create a sense of continuity for a tribe to, to, or, or for the peoples to connect the past to the future, to the present. And um, the fact that the people do not listen to Thomas shows their disconnectedness, okay? The fact that this particular tribe uh, on the reservation does not pay attention to their storyteller shows their disconnect from the land, from each other, from and from their history. And of course, Victor symbolizes, in many ways, symbolizes that disconnect. Um, he's gone and worked for, and if you watch the, um, the interview that I put up um, with Sherman Alexi, um, he talks about, you know, the, uh, the, the red man who, uh, oh gosh, what, I can't remember the, the term that he used, but the, the red man who kind of turns white or try, you know, tries to assimilate. Um, so, so Victor has been that and got fired from that job at the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which was a government agency. And so now he's returned. He's been, he's been estranged from his father. And notice the role that Thomas met, plays in connecting Victor back to his dad, because Thomas has the stories. He has the history. He can show that his dad, that, that, um, Victor has felt spurned by his father, but he can show that his dad, as much as he was able, did have some concern for him at this at a certain points in time. And but only Thomas could show him that. You know, Thomas had those stories. Um, also, what's interesting in the nature of fire, the I the whole idea here, we've got Thomas builds a, the fire. And fire can be destructive, but fire can also be life-giving. And that's one of the things that, that uh, you know, with warmth. And, and so that particular fireworks is a symbol in the story in a lot of ways. And, um, and that's one of the things that Thomas provides for, um, for Victor as he reconnects him to his past. And there is some you know, idea here that even like when they hit that rabbit, everything's dead and they hit that rabbit and it's, there's, there are moments of humor and Thomas does bring humor as well. Um, but there are moments of humor where uh, they now have a shared, they have more shared history uh, together. And this whole idea of, of, you know, Victor sharing the ashes at the, at the, uh, his father's ashes at the end and so forth. Um, what I recommend about the micro settings, there's several. Most of you chose to focus on the trailer, but of course there's the journey in the car. There's the airplane uh, with that, that little incident. Thomas can talk to anybody. That's Thomas's connectedness. That's part of his gift. He's talking to you know, the, the gymnast uh, and they find a, a place of, of shared um, connection. You know, the whole idea of the government sort of stripping both of them of something that they, of identity. Um, so Thomas is a really, really interesting character and a life-giving character, which is, which is uh, interesting enough. And, and one of the things about him is that he knows who he is. He doesn't have to search for identity. Thomas accepts who he is purely and um, whether people will listen to him or people don't listen to him. Um, it doesn't matter. He just has to be about that thing that he is, knows to his core that he is. Right, does anybody have any questions about this um, story? I have graded most of, not all of, but most of your answers um, to the questions. And I do write responses. I, I am sending out copies of good responses if you, it looks like there, you have any confusion. Um, so that email, I mean, that will be, uh, that file is uploaded in the um, same Dropbox where you submitted your work. So you should be able to access that in, through my grades. Does anybody have any questions about this before we finish with Rose for Emily? Sorry, I know we're running a little bit long. All 
All right, last short story, Rose for Emily. Um, significance of the title, Rose, of course, is um, a, gr a great symbol. <laughs> Rose, in this case, can be, um, can be love. Uh, like you can, it, as a matter of fact, that's probably the most common way people interpret that particular symbol for this, this title. Uh, it, so it can be sort of the story itself is kind of paying homage to Emily. Um, so the story's the rose. Uh, it could be that one love interest for, em, you know, uh, of Homer Barron for Emily. Um, so th there are a couple of ways you can interpret that, but the, but the whole idea is um, is yeah you know, this this rather sad p character um, who fails to grow, who's stuck in the past, who um, stuck in time, and uh, and of course she has this tragic outcome. Now this particular story is an example of what's called Southern Gothic literature. Gothic literature, I think Edgar Allan Poe, you know, the Cask of Amontillado, uh, the Raven. Uh, the telltale heart. Um, the elements of Gothic literature are usually some type of mansion or old decrepit house. There's usually they're usually servants. Often the servants know more, just like Tobe in this story. The the servants know the story, uh, but they're kind of behind the scenes. Um, there's usually madness, and there's usually death. Okay, so those are the elements of tradi traditional Gothic literature. Uh, Frankenstein would be considered Gothic literature. Um, Southern Gothic, this is American Southern Gothic literature set in the South. Um, there's quite a bit, a body of Southern Gothic literature. Um, so notice you've got madness with Emily's relatives as well as Emily herself. You've got this old decrepit house decaying house that when people go there you can tell things it just gets worse and worse um, you've uh, you've got death with between the father Emily's ultimate death and then Homer Baron of course um, the murder and then you do have sort of this, the the servant who's sort of behind the scenes uh, in all of this now Emily in many ways symbolizes the old south we're talking civil war south Okay. The uh, there, as a matter of fact, the story at one point mentions this term. Uh, I don't know if you noticed it, but there is a term, uh, noblesse oblige. This is uh, a French term that essentially means the way that aristocrats are supposed are obligated to act. Um, this is thinking, you know, in terms of a social hierarchy and the aristocrats are kind of at the top of the social hierarchy. And so there are certain ways that they are supposed to behave so that people underneath them um, can um, continue to give them respect. And so that um, Emily's family is she's the last of her line of Grierson's there. They've been part of this town forever. Um, and she, in many ways, represents that old South that's clinging on to values and traditions that are no longer um, healthy uh, or valid. Um, now, notice the story is written in sections. There are five sections. It's not told in chronolo chronological order. If it were, you wouldn't have the same we would guess the ending before we got there. But notice that we begin with Emily's death and uh, and the funeral, but then we get backstory and then we go forward in time when people, you know, they talk about the smell. Um, Homer Baron is, is a, a robber baron. You're probably familiar with that term, but a robber baron uh, were after the Civil War were... Uh, after the Civil War, were Northerners who came to the South during Reconstruction to try and make their fortune. Um, Homer Barron would be considered beneath Emily. He probably was never actually interested in Emily necessarily, except as far as her money goes. Um, there was some indication that he actually may have been, uh, may have preferred men. It actually says that. Um, but, and, but Emily was, once her dad died, and notice that her dad kept away all suitors, all of the townspeople who were interested in her, that uh, she was something of a catch at the time. And notice that um, her dad keeps all of, them, all of the young men away. And but so she's after her dad finally dies, she's willing to accept this unacceptable person just because she's so desperate for love. 
and notice that at some point he apparently rejects her and so her answer to that, of course, is she, she goes into sort of full-blown murder and madness there. Uh, the whole idea of the smell, uh, using lime when the townspeople, notice they can't do anything with her. She's intractable. Um, she's unmovable. She's immovable. She will not listen. Um, and again, she symbolizes in many ways this whole idea of a South that will not get over. Uh, and, and this story was written... Oh, I don't remember the actual publication date. Um, again, it's early um, 20th century, but this whole idea of not getting over um, what it once saw itself as and not moving on. And Emily, in many ways, symbolizes that. Okay. Um, that's a quick overview. Does anybody have any questions about this story or anything else we've covered? Yeah, I was wondering if we could yeah. have like a... Uh... You could show us what we need to write, like an uh, example of the writing we need to do. This is the first, you mean for the essay? Yeah, for the essay. Okay, I will try and find a, try and find a, a sample paper. Honestly, this is the first time I've given this particular assignment. Um, so I have lots of samples of what I used to do, but I don't have any samples of, of this paper. But I'll write, I'll either write one myself or I'll find something and upload it. Okay, it's it's a good request, and that normally I do provide a sample, at least one sample paper, so that you can look at it to see what to do. So I'll find something for you. Any other questions? All right, sorry for keeping you long. Um, please don't hesitate to email me if you have questions. Uh, and the test will open at 8 o'clock Friday morning, uh, and it will remain open until Monday night at 11.59. By that point, I should have all of your stuff graded. Um, if it's not already, please review before you take the test. Please don't wait till the last minute. Please make sure you're working at a reliable computer because I do not reset tests once you've opened them. Um, and because unfortunately I've had, I had I've had some people cheat um, when I've done it and and it was obvious that's what happened so I've, I've had to have uh, develop that policy um, so if you have any questions for me please don't hesitate to call or, I mean, or ask uh, and also remember that you can set up individual appointments we will use this system blackboard collaborate and and talk just like we are now and I'll be glad at any time to talk about anything you want to so all right good afternoon